I'm going to show you a real case study of clients we work with that have a net worth north of $20 million. Now, this is going to be a controversial episode. Many of you guys have dropped comments saying, Ari, why are you helping people with $20 million plus dollars? Don't they already have enough? And you'd be shocked by the amount of people that have anxiety that have way more money when they think they shouldn't. They're like, hey, shouldn't I not worry about this anymore? Don't I have enough money that it doesn't matter? But the truth is, when you have more money, more often than not, you go, well, I have way more to lose. I don't want to screw up the legacy for my family. I want to make sure I'm optimizing. I don't want to leave anything on the table. So I'm going to show you how I think through this. Now, there are going to be lessons here, whether you have 500,000 or 1 million or 5 million or 20 million. So I'm going to make it broad, but I'm going to show you a case study with how I help a client who has 20 million plus dollars optimize their strategy. Now, last year I put out a video of a couple that has north of $10 million and I titled it, I have 10 million bucks, how do I optimize? And you guys can see in the comments that there are some people that feel very differently from you. And the reason I'm starting off the video this way is you can see someone right here says 25,000 a year for travel. That's like one nice two week trip. We're gonna do one of those per quarter. So here's a couple spending 100,000 a year on travel. They're saying you only live once. Well, that's great. Someone else with $500,000, they can't do that. They'll run out of money too quickly. So the reason I'm bringing this up, no matter where you are in your journey, look at this right here. If you want a case study of a couple that has 500,000 or a million or 2 million, I have so many different case studies. I want to help as many people as possible, but I am not going to ignore the people that have north of $20 million because they often are ignored and that's not fair either. I grew up, as most of you know, in Malibu, California, very affluent area. I did not want to be a brat growing up like a lot of the kids I was around. And my parents were like, look, I want to live by the beach. I want to surf. Now, I'm lucky that they wanted to do that because I had an awesome upbringing, but I was around some characters. That's me being nice, okay? Some of these characters I saw squander millions of dollars, and then there were a few people that I went, well, how do you have 20, 30 million plus dollars? And some of those strategies are what I'm going to share today. And the reason I am an advisor is because my parents were burned by four advisors. Now, why am I lucky? Because my parents like what they do. They make movies for a living. But they, if it was up to them, truly wouldn't be working at the same pace they are today. And once again, it's because there were a few advisors that gave them poor advice along the way. Thus, why I'm an advisor today. Now, as someone who's making videos regularly, you're going to get some odd comments. Look at this one right here from Ernest Sanchez I6K says $10 million, things to avoid, don't be stupid and, and don't say you have $10 million, end of the video. So there's going to be some trolling that naturally happens, but there are lots of people that have north of $20 million. I looked it up to see the average. In the United States, there's between 100,000 to 200,000 households that have a net worth north of $20 million, and there's not a lot of videos or podcasts helping those people out. So don't go beat them up in the comments. Maybe we can learn something together, and if you go, wow, this was helpful, but I want a case study for my situation, you can go check out one of my other videos. So what do you say we learn about this couple? Let's look at them. So I'm changing their names to preserve their identity. John and Jane, these is a real couple, real ages. I'm only changing the names. 50 and 48, they have three children, 16, 14, and 18. Now this couple, when they started working with us, they didn't start by working with my team directly. They started by using this academy. Now this academy is a feature, it's an option for those of you that go, look, I wanna run my own projections, I'm with Vanguard or Fidelity or Empower, I have an advisor, they're a family friend, maybe I could do a lot better, but I don't know, let me start somewhere. So they went into this software, they played around with it, they used and followed the videos, but they still didn't have peace of mind, and that's when people reach out to us. So they went through it, they didn't fill it out to the degree I would like, and now they know I beat them up over that a little bit, not actually beating them up, okay? I will joke and say I'm the meanest advisor that you'll ever meet. Now, I'm not actually mean, so many of you have said, Ari, don't say mean, I don't like that you say that. I'm not mean, okay? I'm just very transparent, and many of you know that. I don't want you to run the risk of getting unlucky, and so the first thing I'll do when I'm looking at planning is run my gut check, and my gut check for this particular couple was when they put their goals in, so once again, 58 and 40, 
They're like, look, we actually like what we do. We sold a business, so now we're doing a different career. We make way less money, but we have less responsibility. So we like that. Now they're spending $7,000 a month. That's what they would love to spend. So I'm like, okay, 7,000 a month, tell me more. Because if they're only spending 7,000 a month, they're gonna run out of, not run out of money, they're gonna essentially be like, hey, I have way too much money at the end. So I don't want them to be mad at me later and I don't want them to run the risk of running out of money. Two important things to be aware of. So they put in some basic healthcare costs and long-term care. These are the default estimates so I could tell they didn't change them. And then they went in here and said, yeah, our kids are gonna go to college, but we don't really know where. And so they just took the national average. I want them to specifically put in a college and go, yeah, what if my kid's gonna go to Vanderbilt, just for example. Okay, well, what is the cost for that? Okay, $61,000, I wanna plan for that, plus textbooks and fees and yada yada. Okay, great, is there any scholarships? What's the breakdown? And of course, you're never gonna know exactly where every kid's gonna go. But they have one child who's 18, who's going to community college, but wants to transfer to another school. So we want you to get really granular to the degree possible, and I want them to dream bigger. So I'm like, hey, are we gonna plan for weddings for the kids? Are we gonna possibly relocate? What does a legacy look like to you? How much would you gift for charitable giving or personal gifts? Like, build this out even more, not just rough kind of cookie cutter stuff like this. And they're like, oh cool, I just didn't know I could do that. So, they're not against that, they were open to that feedback. Now, when I'm looking at their plan, as many of you can allude to or um, infer right now, that they're gonna be in a good spot. And so when I was running a few different projections for them, I'm just gonna reset this for a second, they are in a good spot. And so right now, if you look at their plan in terms of assets, I'm gonna go through it in detail with you. 14 million of what they have are liquid assets, the rest is real estate. So if their 14 million just keeps growing, they're gonna have $200 million. Now, they're like, look, we'd love to spend 7,000 a month, but we are really interested in charitable giving and more vacations with the family. I said, okay, what if your monthly expenses were 20,000 a month and you spent trips, vacations every year at 100,000 a year? What would that do to the plan? And yes, there's way less money and this scared them because they're like, look, I don't wanna screw something up, 62 million fewer dollars. Oh my gosh, that could do so much for our family. And I go, I get that, but there's still $150 million at the end. Now, we make one little tweak to this and assume their investments don't do well, which is unlikely. Watch what happens now. All I did was assume that their investments do really poorly. I'm talking 4% growth with 3% inflation. Like they're gonna do way better than that. But I'm showing this because I have a certain couple and they know who they are because they watch my videos. They don't have $20 million, but they have three to four million and they came to me and they're like, look, I think I've done a good job saving and investing, but I don't wanna take risk anymore. I don't wanna ever be down more than 10%. And I said, that's okay, you can do that, but I'd recommend you work longer. And they're like, what do you mean? My neighbor retired on way less money. I go, yeah, but when it comes to your plan, you wanna spend way more. And because they wanna spend less and they have a pension and social security already turned on, based on your plan, it wouldn't be sustainable unless you want to invest a little differently. You make a few tweaks to your investments, this is really going to shift whether there's 200 million or 100 million. These are big numbers we're talking about and you don't want it to take lightly. So when it comes to healthcare and they're not doing more savings to their 401k today, they're like, I think we've saved enough. I'm like, you have saved enough, but this is free money. So with your current 401k, we want to take advantage of free money. Why would we not at least do the employer match? So there's a few no-brainer things that I'm like, hey, I want to talk about this with them in more detail. But I like to go to my stress test page. This is where people go, well, you really are the meanest advisor. Now, once again, I try not to ever be really mean, but I want to be very transparent and say, look, what if you're unlucky and markets drop like crazy this year? 60%. Is that unrealistic? Yes. But 2008 was 40, 50%. What if social security is reduced significantly? What if inflation, like it has been, just goes up like crazy? What if returns go down and they just don't do what you expect them to do? And you live 10 years longer, so now you're 100, and healthcare costs and taxes go up. 
what if we're unlucky? What does that mean for our plan? Some people I'll run all these projections with and they'll go, so if I'm like the most unlucky person ever, I'm still not going to run the risk of running out of money. Like, why am I worrying? Other people go, okay, so if I'm really unlucky, maybe I spend a little bit more when I actually want to because I have my energy and health. Then I'm open to spending a little bit less, maybe in my 70s to 80s, before it shoots up again at the end when there's charitable giving or medical expenses or things like that. So this is where I'm starting with a couple. I have to pick and choose. The main thing for all of you to know for this particular couple, when we look at their investments, they have a few different things going on. They have a traditional, so just traditional 401k, not a Roth 401k, with $3.5 million. They have a Roth 401k with 150,000. They have a 457b, an IRA, a Roth IRA, and then here's the big one. They have a brokerage account with $9.3 million. Now, this particular couple, they sold a business and there's inheritance. So there's a few things going on here, but if this was all 9 million bucks in a 401k, well, that would significantly change a plan because the required distributions would be very different. What on earth does that mean? Well, here's a couple right now. This is what they're bringing in the door. So 360,000, that's just coming in through their income today. They would love to spend 140,000 on expenses, just making your living. Now goals, that's what I just brought up. Education and vacation. Some of these things will stop. Maybe kids go to grad school, who knows, and I want them to plan for that because I want them to dream big, this couple. They have a lot of money and I don't want them to be mad at me later, but there's a few no-brainer things. So yes, I want them to plan for vacations, but is it gonna be forever at this degree? Maybe not. So maybe we put them in for only a short period of time and then put it in again later. The big thing is planned distributions, those are what are called required distributions. So you can see this couple, there's gonna be a few years where their income is zero. Now it won't actually be zero because they're gonna have interest and dividends and other things, but before, let's assume, for example, they wanna delay social security, just an example. They might not have income for many, many years, and then all of a sudden, they're gonna have what are called required minimum distributions. And you can see here, if their 401k, IRA, or pre-tax assets just keep growing, they're gonna start taking a million dollars, north of a million, 1.16, out in 2049. So some people are like, 2049, will I even be alive then? It's like, yes, you will, and I don't want you to be mad at me when that happens. So they're gonna have a lot of income because interest, dividends, social security, what if they decide that they wanna have a rental property? Lots of things going on. So what's gonna happen is they're gonna have 1.1 million that has to come out of their 401k. That gets taxed at the highest marginal bracket. They're also gonna have 200,000 just coming in from other income sources. So now 1.4 million, that's coming in the door. Whether they want to or not, that is coming in. Now, they're also gonna have expenses. Now, is it gonna be 600,000 worth of expenses? Seems a little crazy, but they might be legitimately living and going, we wanna spend way more, 20,000 a month is awesome, and you know, housing costs are going up, and healthcare is going up. So there might be some really big expenses. But what you can start to see is as we go to the right here, this is what's called unsaved cash flows. This is extra money. This is like, hey, after all the spending they do, after all the required distributions, this column here, all of these dollars get taxed at their highest possible bracket. So you can see here, what this is saying is they're gonna start by having to pay 22,000 at the highest bracket, then 45, then 75, then 100. Doesn't seem like a big deal now, but watch this. Watch what happens, and this is why I love this software versus any other software. If they go, Ari, I know you told me I could spend 20,000 a month. I don't have it in me. I don't wanna spend 20,000 a month. I go, okay, what about 12,000 a month? They go, yeah, I could do 150,000 a year. And what if our investments do really well? Like, let's just take a moderate approach, just hypothetical. Let's go back to the cash flows. And I want you to see what just happened. All I did was make a few minor tweaks. Now let's go back to those required distributions. Well, first of all, they're higher. Why are they higher? They're higher because I just showed that their investments are doing even better. 
which means if their 401ks keep growing, the required distribution is going to be larger. Now, quick funny story, but someone said, Ari, why, why would I do this? Why don't I just not invest well so that my required distributions aren't as high? I said, that's the equivalent of declining a bonus because you're going to have to pay taxes. Don't do that. But for this couple, they're still going to have expenses and cash and goals that they're going to want to take vacations and charitable giving and all this fun stuff. But you can see it starts to really add up. We're now 100000 200,000, 300, 400, 500, 600 is all getting taxed at the highest bracket possible. So for couples that are coming to me that have generally north of 10 million plus dollars, the most important thing to think about is tax planning, is tax planning and estate planning, because these are where a lot of the value can be added. If we're intentional with our tax strategy and conversions and all that fancy stuff, it can add $7 million more million. It can be significant. But what if this couple has children that go, look, we're just not going to be making a lot of money. We're choosing a career that generally doesn't pay well, but we just don't know what to do. Well, what's going to happen is these conversions might make sense, but you might want to do way less of them. Maybe it will still add a million dollars, but the difference of a million dollars versus a child that is a physician in California and maybe paying 45% in taxes, the quality, meaning the value of doing tax planning, rises at a significant rate. So this is the ordinary income. There's capital gains. There's Medicare premiums. There's all these different things that get impacted if you're not strategic about tax planning. So when someone wants to get my green light of, hey, am I optimizing? I'll say, let me see your 2040 return. And they're like, what? You know, I'm trying to get through this year. I go, that's great, but I need to start seeing, I mean, let's look at your income. I'm looking at line nine of your total income of a return. I'm looking at what taxable interest and dividends are going to look like. This is what someone should be doing if they have significant assets. Now, the next piece I'll often go to is estate planning. So this couple is like, look, I know we need to get the trust and the will, but we're behind and we don't know what to do. And how do we think through this? And I said, first, just go put your basic information in. Do you have a will? Do you have power of attorney? We do all of this for our clients because most people just go, oh, I've been meaning to get to it, but I just don't want to do it wrong or it's on the to-do list and that's common. But that's not estate planning. Estate planning looks like this. What is our plan? so that my net worth is not $130 million and we're having to pay $4 million in taxes and my heirs are going to receive $100 million so that they decide, wait a second, my mom and dad crushed it. Why would I work hard? Now it's impacting the family and I saw that happen in Malibu growing up where parents, not saying it's any of you guys, but they're like, look, my kids wouldn't do that. They're going to be great. And then all of a sudden, the kids are great people, but they're like, maybe I don't have to work as hard because I'm going to inherit all this money. And there's not transparent conversations within the family about this. So you can see this couple, they want to do giving, but they don't want to give so much that it takes away from their ability to meet their goals. And there's a, a balance there, but you can see they're not doing any estate planning. This couple is like, look, we don't, we want to make sure maybe we live till 90, plan for funeral expenses at 10,000 bucks and maybe some probate stuff that that's not going deep enough. Now, there are so many different instruments. I'm not going to bore you to death with all of them, but I'm going to give you an example of one of them. So you can see here, there's a credit shelter trust. There's a charitable remainder trust. There's a charitable lead. Tr there's so many different things. And there's a famous YouTube video, I forget what it's called, but where someone talks, I know this advisor, they go, hey, if you have north of $5 million, you should consider a charitable trust. So someone came to me, not this couple, but someone said, Ari, you know, I saw on some YouTube video that if I have north of $5 million, maybe it's going to make sense for me, meaning it's going to minimize my tax liability and I can give more. Maybe I should do a charitable trust. And I said, maybe. And they go, well, I kind of already did it. I go, what do you think? They go, it didn't work. And I said, look, they all work. All of these things exist for a reason. It might not be of the best timing when you executed it for your plan, but when it comes to estate planning, I'll say, look, 
heart medications, I, I don't need heart medication, but it's great for my dad. And that's the way all of these work. Sometimes a, a QPERT, so Qualified Personal Residence Trust, when someone has significant net worth and they're worried about passing on assets to children who might not manage it properly, sometimes this can be awesome. Sometimes a donor advised fund, which is you, I'll give you a basic example, like this couple here. Let's assume you put $10,000 into Apple stock and it grew to a million dollars. That's awesome. But if you were to just sell that and give it to a charity, you're gonna have to pay capital gains taxes. You can avoid that by giving the million dollars of Apple stock to the Taublieb, which is my last name, Giving Foundation. Now the government goes, "Are right, you can't go give this to your fiance or your kids, but, and I don't have kids yet, but, you are going to get a huge tax deduction this year. And we're so happy you did this because now you can only give it to 501c3 organizations. So what happens is I get a big tax deduction in that year, up to 30% of your adjusted gross income. So if my income is crazy high, this is going to save me a ton in taxes. I get a huge deduction. Maybe I pair that with a Roth conversion. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So I get a huge deduction by giving stock don't sell it, I just give it to my own foundation. Government says, Ari, good job. I pair that with doing a Roth conversion. A Roth conversion, what does that do? That increases your income. I'm moving money from my IRA to my Roth IRA, so I'm getting a big deduction, which brings down my income, and I'm doing a Roth conversion, which brings up my income, and if I can offset it properly, I might be able to move money from my 401k, which is gonna have huge required distributions, to my Roth IRA where there are no required distributions. So this is an example of estate planning it goes a lot deeper than what I just went over, but most of my clients don't want to have 100, 200 million dollars left over. They want to spend, they want to make sure they're not overlooking anything, and there's lots of instruments out there. I don't want to go through every single one. There are donor advised funds and slats and CRTs and all this fancy stuff. Some of these play a big role, some of these are irrelevant, but I wanna make sure that you're not accidentally going and implementing something that you just saw on a YouTube video, even like this, don't go do a donor advised fund. This is almost like doing a surgical procedure. You wanna do it right, you, you definitely wanna have a professional if you're helping to execute something like this. Now, certain things I'll tell clients, I'll go, look, before we look into any of this stuff, I want you to dream big. How much would you love to spend? What would you love to give? What if your kids go to grad school? What if you want to help them with a down payment? Because that shifts the entire strategy. Too often, I find people that have 10, 15, 20, 30 million dollars want to start hopping into tell me the estate and the tax and I want to make sure I'm optimizing. And I'm like, look, I want you to optimize as well. But you didn't do the work up front yet to dream in a massive way about what you want this money to create for you and your family. So I'll start there and then get to my optimization. So I know this was a lot, it was a longer video. I wanna help those that oftentimes don't always get the most guidance. I personally love playing soccer. I, and it's gonna sound bad, but I'm gonna just be very honest, when I go to certain physical therapy offices, I don't wanna be seen by someone who's also having to treat four other patients at the same time. I know that can sound bad, but when I'm in pain, and I'm in pain often, unfortunately, because I play soccer too much, but I'm kind of an addict and I love it, what happened, I need one-on-one -on -one attention. I'm happy to pay for that. Could I go to Kaiser and, and get cheaper treatment? Of course. And maybe if I paid attention better at physical therapy, maybe I'd get good guidance, but I sleep better at night, which is the point of me saying this, by going to a physical therapy office that's further away. My fiance even goes, Ari, we have good ones nearby. Why don't you pick one of those? I go, look, I sleep better having that physical therapist tell me what my MRI means because the physician says something, they say something else. They're the one actually working with me on an ongoing basis. And I wanna play soccer competitively when I'm 60. That is a goal of mine. Now, am I gonna be at the same level I am now? Now, of course not, but I love it. And this is what I care about. So I'll often tell my clients who have money like this, hey, how often are you getting massages and doing physical therapy and doing all of these things? Because it's naturally hard for people that have often a lot of money these are still very frugal people. Sometimes these people go, look, I just don't have it in me to spend. It feels weird. My identity has been saving for 30 years. I inherited this money. We sold this business. We didn't think this was gonna happen. And we have what we have today 
because of that mindset. So now you want me to just switch and start spending money? It's not a light switch. I expect you to automatically become an amazing spender. But I do want you to understand the ramifications of planning and help you optimize because you work too hard not to. So the same philosophy I'm sharing, if you don't have $20 million, you have $5 million or $2 million. You can use the same strategies and principles I'm discussing. You might just not need to use some of this fancy stuff. It might be helpful but irrelevant to your plan. So when it comes to your strategy, I just want you to know the earliest time working is truly optional and that you are making the most of everything and not leaving anything on the table. So hopefully this was helpful. This is part one, I know. You're like, part one, this was 20 plus minutes, Ari. What is this, you want me to not watch a movie tonight? Am I gonna just have to watch you do this stuff? So. Dumb joke, I know. But part two is going to be a little bit more nuanced as to how do I invest? What does the tax strategy look like? Because I'm talking high level today. I want to give another example in more depth. This video might get way fewer views than a lot of my others because not everyone has 20 million plus dollars. But I want you to truly know I am here to help no matter where you're at in your stage of life. I believe in that. That's why I have this $300 option. And ultimately, planning and hiring an advisor, I don't think everyone needs it. And other advisors hate when I say that, but I think it depends of stage of life, experience, what you're looking for. And ultimately, I just want you to sleep better and go, yep, making the most out of everything I work so hard for. So that's it for part one. Stay tuned for part two. I want you, I've already shared this a few times, but if you're going, I wanna work with you and your team on an ongoing basis, you can do that by looking in the description of this episode clicking the link, applying to work with us, and following those steps. So that's it for this episode. See you guys next time. Please like this and share it with someone you want to retire early with. And at a minimum, subscribe so that you continue getting information just like this only if it resonates with you. Thanks, guys.